action. Oh, you guys are, sometimes you make life hard for me because I was really crabby last night because I just had this impending sense that God was going to take everything I'd worked on all week and change it. It was all going to happen this morning and I was too tired from starting generators and bumping my head in the dark on a beam trying to wire in a generator. And my wife has a black eye from the piano, so... I'm, I'm just saying, you know, yeah. But um, how fun that what tr- God gave Tracy and Michelle put together just fits so good. Uh, and I've, I've talked on the Sermon on the Mount before, and so I thought that'll be easy. We'll just kind of follow what we've done before. And God says, no, this is a different time and a different age and a different people and a different place and a different message and different hearts. So here's what I want to do. So we're told, so we're told, okay, we're good. I just took the heavy Bible off. We're good. All right. We're told that um, Jesus had been traveling through the synagogues and teaching. Matthew tells us at the end of chapter 4. So if you want to read along, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. But he tells us that he was traveling throughout the uh, region and um, people were coming to him from everywhere, from Jerusalem, from Judea, from across the Jordan, from the Decapolis, from Syria, from all over. And they were bringing people to be healed and he was healing them and the multitudes were getting large. And it tells us that he took his disciples. It says he went up on a mountain, but he was somewhere near the Sea of Galilee. And the word for mountain is both in Greek and Hebrew can mean hillside as well. And I took this picture looking down at the Mount of traditional Mount of Beatitudes. It was just so interesting because I picked up there on the left some mustard seed, in the middle of tares, on the right some oats. And this is how Jesus taught. Wherever he would go, he'd pick up a prop. And he would meet people where they're at, and he would use real-life examples. This has been quite a week for a lot of us. A lot of anxiety, a lot of, they shut our, we just got our power back at 2 a.m. last night because where we are, they were afraid limbs would blow down and it would start fires. And was it two years ago, right about now, that we had the devastating fires? What, night before last, we lost McIver Park due to fire, it's quite a, quite a raging fire, but the wind quit about the right time or who knows where it would have went. Um, I, like the, uh, I like the video of the chosen, make me a map of, and, it, and then, he, then he quotes the Sermon on the Mount and the disciple says, how's that a map? And he says, wherever these people are is where you will find me. And there's a famous story in the legends of the Jews. Um, they ask one of the prophets, when Messiah comes, where will I find him? And the prophet said, you will find him in the leper colony bandaging the wounds of the lepers. So. This was the attitude they had of when Messiah came, he would be this kind of person. But in this same crowd, there would be people today with daggers hidden under their cloaks, ready ready for a leader to take them and overthrow the Romans. And others crippled from birth or dying of some unknown disease coming to him saying, Master, I will die if you don't do something. So this is the world, world we're, we're in. Um, ironically, I learned the most from my students this week. A lot of this is old material to me, and God brings it back fresh. But the two things I learned this week, one, I get a text this morning from Dan Foster, professor at Maryland University, and said, who said that? You quote it. Who said it? That much of what I know I learned from my teachers, 
but most of what I know I learned from my students. I thought, he woke me up with that text. I thought, is this, an, is this where we're going today, Lord? I quote that, but I don't know where I heard it. Maybe from a seminar I went to, etc. So I start studying, I start researching. Guess who? You know, you know the person. We talked two weeks ago about a man named Hanina Bendoza. And Gamliel came to him and said, my son is sick, do something. And Hanina Bendoza went into his upper room and he prayed and he could tell by the way the words came out that God had answered the prayer and his son would be healed. That's who said, he also had a band of disciples, and that's who said, much of what I learned, I learned from my teachers, but most of what I learned, I learned from my students. Somebody called me this week and said, we were reading today that when Lazarus died, Jesus came, and then he wept. Why was he weeping? He knew he was going to raise Lazarus. Why do we weep at funerals today? Because we know that person's going to be raised again. What was going on? It just didn't make sense. And I thought, I gave my first answer was, well, I think one thing is he just hated death. Death signifies the darkness of this world and everything that's wrong with this world. And it came because of sin, and it's still here and it will be defeated, and Jesus did defeat it, and we're going to see it end. But in the meantime, he was weeping because he hated death. I think that was an okay answer, but I don't think that was the right answer. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so today's 9-11. Everybody knows where they were when that happened, and it hit us all like a ton of bricks, and we watched people jumping out of 15-story windows rather than be burned alive. And it's ironic that in the Hebrew months, they number them differently. Their nine, they number the day and then the month, but their 9-11 was the ninth of Av, and that's when the Babylonians destroyed and burnt the first temple, and that's when the Romans destroyed and burnt the second temple. And it's known as a day of mourning, a day of recognizing that if we don't follow the Lord, there are consequences, national consequences, severe consequences. And that's the month we're in right now leading up to a significant Jewish appointed time. Have you looked at the moon this month? Is it a sliver right now last night, last couple of nights, or is it, it's a full moon. So that means we're right in the middle of the month. The month starts from when they can see that first sliver of moon and ends when it disappears and they wait until the first sliver of moon shows for the next month. And then that's when they know it's, it's the next month. So we're in that period of the month of Elu where people are thinking this could be the end of the world and the Lord is going to return, Messiah is going to come, and it's going to come at a time when we don't know the day or the hour. And that's the nickname for the next sliver of moon. It's called Rosh Hashanah. Next week, I'm going to teach on, did Jesus abolish the law? A great question that we all struggle with. And then in two weeks, the day before Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to teach on what is hell, which is the destination of all mankind who don't, haven't eaten from the tree of life, Jesus Christ, and received his forgiveness. So we're in that exciting time here, but this is that month when all of Judea was looking internally. What sins have I committed that I need to make right? Who have I offended that I need to go back to? This was called the 40 days of reflection. 
And then starting on that new moon day, Rosh Hashanah, it's the day of trumpets. They blow trumpets all over the place. And they expect if the Lord's going to return, it's going to be now. And may we please be found written in your book of life. And then if the Lord doesn't come, in 10 days they have Yom Kippur where they offer that national sacrifice. Kill the one lamb, turn the one away, the goat, and it's pushed over a cliff and it takes the sins away. And they pray, Lord, may my name be written in your book of life for one more year. And then in five days they have this huge celebration called Shavuot, I mean Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's kind of the season they were in leading up to. And we're, we're in that season right now with this 9-11 that we're in. And I think worldwide, there is cause for anxiety. And I pulled out, uh, you've seen me quote out of that sermon journal of C.A. Mead, Tracy and Cheryl's great-great-grandfather. And I'm looking at it. And it, when he was in this church in 1918, World War I had been going on for three and a half years. He writes something about, is that the three and a half years of the seven years tribulation? And then he writes something about Kaiser, the, the, the leader of Germany. His, his, the numbers of his name add up to 666. And the life expectancy in 1918, had fallen drastically because of the Spanish flu and the war. The life expectancy was age 36 to 37, the lowest it's been in all of the 1900s and the 2000s. We panicked this year because some people did because our life expectancy went from 78 to 76. Horrible! Well, imagine being there in 1918 and seeing that and wondering, this has got to be the end. And I think they sincerely had the right to do that. And I think we sincerely have the right to look at that also and say, how much longer can this go on? As long as God needs it to go on to reach as many people as he needs to reach. And he wants us to join him in that process. And I think that's what Sermon on the Mount is all about. So we know that Jesus went... Uh, up on the uh, up on this hill and it says that seeing this vast multitude of people Jesus took his disciples went up on a mountain or a hillside and he sat down remember we talked about if it's going to be a short message you're going to stand up but if the rabbi sits down you better find a place to sit because he's going to teach and he sat down and opening his mouth he began to teach them and he said Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those, blessed are you, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men persecute you and cast insults at you and say all kinds of evil about you. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember I gave you a homework assignment. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Every man who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them may be compared to the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And I said, what words? What specific words was he talking about when he said that? Did anybody come up with that? Just raise your hand if you figured it out. 
All right, well, we're going to look. This is like, you ever read a book and you start to read it and you read the first page or chapter and then you turn to the back, the last chapter? Let me show you the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, oh, and I wanted to show you this. These subtitles, the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, those were not in the original scripture. Those are added by the translators so that you, are, you will know that these are Beatitudes. Whatever a Beatitude is, these are them. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when he got all done... And he even said, on that day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name and perform miracles in your name and do all kinds of good things in your name? And he said, depart from me, I never knew you. And then he says, for everyone who hears these words of mine, the entire Sermon on the Mount could definitely and does mean every word he said, but specifically the Sermon on the Mount and I cannot emphasize enough that if we figure out the Sermon on the Mount, we have insight into all of Jesus' ministry and all the New Testament. It's all right here. But all too often we make some false assumptions, not necessarily bad, not necessarily incorrect, but not what the people sitting there that day heard. And if we can go back and we can recreate the Sermon on the Mount and we can hear it through the ears of the people who were living that age, as well as the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, we will be well on our way to being like the man who built his house on a rock and it doesn't matter what comes, you are going to stand. But if we get things wrong or we poo-poo, or we make false assumptions, or we hear them and we do not act upon them, we'll be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the first rain that comes, the first wind that blows, the first flash flood down the wadi, your house is gone. And so that's what this Sermon on the Mount, that's the beginning and the end. And there's one more verse after this. Remember, he starts out, and we picture him talking to his 12 disciples, right? First of all, he hasn't called 12 yet, but he's got a bunch following him. But at the end, it says, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not like their scribes and teachers. So what we actually have here is Jesus sitting down, in this grassy plain, and his disciples are around him, and he's teaching them. And we have mil uh, millions, thousands of people trying to hear. And what's so neat about that is this little amphitheater here. He could sit at the top with his disciples, and everyone could hear his message. When he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Silence would have fallen over this. And you could hear the waters of the Sea of Galilee in the background. And they're hanging on his next words. And that's what we're going to look at today. What did he mean by these words? And the key here is, blessed are and kingdom of heaven. So, let me just tell you that kingdom of heaven, when our commentators comment on the Sermon on the Mount and all of Matthew, they assume Jesus is talking about heaven someday. Well, do you remember your mom and your mom and your mom and your mom when they were surprised they would say, oh my heavens. Can you hear him say that? Oh my heavens. They were saying heaven, so they wouldn't say, oh my, G-O-D. Well, that goes all the way back to the time of Jesus. It's called a circumlocution. That's a big word. Shouldn't even use it. Substitute word. The Jewish people did not ever want to blasphemy or, or do anything improper in referring to the name of God. That would be like 
mispronouncing the name of the King of England or whatever. Um, it, it, they were afraid of offending God by saying his name wrong or even saying it inappropriately or out of context. So they would substitute the word heaven for the word God or Lord or Adonai. And they would say, and if God had a kingdom, it would be called the kingdom of heaven. Now, when you read Luke, the same t passage, Luke uses the term the kingdom of God. So right now, I want to establish in our minds that the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about is heaven someday, but it's also now, and it also has been. Remember in the burning bush? God was present in this bush. And how did Moses know he was present in this bush? Two things. It was burning, but not consumed. And God spoke from it. And he said, basically, I am the God who is, who was, and who is yet to come. Jesus came and said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the God who was, who is, and is yet to come. And God started this kingdom called the kingdom of God when he created the heavens and the earth and placed Adam in a garden. And it's continued to be a kingdom of his people who make it up. And then he sent his son to redeem it. And Je a kingdom has to have a king. And Jesus is the king of that kingdom. And the kingdom that was, that is when he's teaching this, and that is yet to come. So we make, sometimes make the mistake, and, and we, we do this Sermon on the Mount, we say, uh, blessed are uh, the poor in spirit that to modern theologians can mean not proud in spirit, just humble. And how often do we do, have you done daily vacation Bible schools on the Beatitudes? Remember, we, I was thinking this morning while you're singing that song, we sang that song in Arizona when we were doing a Bible school on the Indian Reservation and we were doing it on the bee attitudes, and the theme was bees and beekeeping. Bee attitude, you know. So anyway, kind of corny, but the kids seem to like it. And you guys, have, you guys, it's Colton community, or Col Canyon View is known in the Colton community for doing a really good vacation Bible school. And I'm sure that you've probably done the bee attitudes through the years at your vacation Bible school. So we teach these children, just have a humble spirit, be gentle, Seek peace. It's okay to mourn. It's um, desire righteousness through Jesus Christ. And don't worry if you're persecuted, for you will be part of heaven to come. And that's great. That's absolutely great, and that's absolutely right on. But let's see if... And those are all true statements based on the Bible, but what did the people hear that day? And I remember sitting here on this hill with a man named Shlomo, which is, his English name is Solomon, Shlomo. And Shlomo sits down to read the Sermon on the Mount, and he reads it in Hebrew. And every verse starts with, Ashrei, instead of blessed, Ashrei are the Ruachani, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the Malchut HaShamayim, the kingdom of heaven. Ashrei are those who mourn. Ashrei are those, um, are the gentle. Ashrei are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Ashrei are the uh, merciful, for they will receive mercy. Ashrei are the um, peacemakers. Ashrei are the pure in heart. And I really thought, I'm going to look into that Hebrew word, ashrei, because Jesus was speaking Hebrew. And he almost certainly, instead of saying blessed are, he would have been saying ashrei. I looked up, um, the word beatitude is defined as a state, and I don't agree with this necessarily, a state of the utmost bliss. The eight beatitudes, there's actually nine, but the eight beatitudes are therefore the roadmap. Jesus gives us to help us find the utmost bliss in this world and in the next. And Bible translations will use, instead of ashrei, which nobody would know what meant, they generally put 
blessed are. Some put, lucky you are if you're poor in spirit and you mourn. Some put, how fortunate are you if, and these say, you are experiencing the utmost bliss if you're poor in spirit and you're mourning. And I don't think we have an English word for ashray, and I'll begin to tell you about that word. So we have blessed are and the kingdom of heaven. Now we got the middle word. The first one is ruach ani, the poor in spirit. And then the people sitting there were very familiar with this word poor in spirit. And it didn't mean spiritually humble versus spiritually arrogant. Um, It meant you are about as low as you can be You're about as desperate as you can be. You may well die if you don't get help. This is, we had a friend that a year ago almost drowned in the ocean and was miraculously saved. But in the course of those waves, he was ruachani, poor in spirit. How many of you have looked at death or you're about as low as you can get because your parent just died or someone just died, or maybe divorce, or maybe terminal cancer has come, or you fill in the blank, but what is the lowest you've ever been and you didn't know if you were going to be able to get up again? You were so down, you were not just on your knees, but you were flat, you didn't know if you could get up again, that's ruachani, Ruach means spirit, Ani means the poor. And yet Jesus said, Ashrei, are you, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. What in the world did he mean by that? And then he said, Ashrei, are you who mourn, for you shall be comforted. And that's when I started thinking, Jesus wept. Jesus went to Bethany, which is right next to Jerusalem, just over the hill. He'd been sent a message four days before that, that Lazarus, whom he loved, had died. He shows up outside of Bethany, and Martha comes to meet him, and they have this conversation, and she's pretty distraught. And he says, Martha, Lazarus will live again. And she says, Rabbi, I know in the resurrection he will live again. And he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. I am the resurrection and the life, actually. And then back in the house, Mary didn't get up. She's sitting on the floor. She's what they call sitting Shiva. Shiva is a word for seven. When somebody lost someone they loved, they sat on, they took all the furniture out of the house and they sat on the floor for seven days. And if people wanted to come and comfort them, they would just come in and sit down. Remember Job's friends sat for seven days and didn't say a word? That's where this custom came from. They could come in, they could sit down. If Mary wanted to talk to them, she could. But if she didn't feel like it, she didn't have to because she was ruachani, she was poor in spirit. She didn't know if she was going to get up again. And then Martha comes in. And she gets down on the floor with Mary and she says, the master's here. The master wants to see you. Mary didn't have to get up because tradition said she could stay and mourn, but she got up. She went out to meet him, and there were all of these people wailing because they thought that was somehow consolation to the people who had lost. Oh, oh, like they were miserable, and this was all going on. And Mary comes up to Jesus, and she said, Master, if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. And that's when Jesus wept not just because he hated death, but because he felt the emotion 
of Mary, who was poor in spirit, who was so low. How was she ever going to get up again? And in a way, symbolically, he gets down on his hands and knees, and he whispers in her ear, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And he's weeping too. And right after that, he says, roll that stone away. Lazarus, come out. And he came out. And he came back to life. And he helped Mary get up. And the kingdom of heaven had arrived and was yet to come. Blessed are those who mourn, for you shall be comforted in some way. And so we, we go through the Beatitudes. And I actually was looking last night in my notes. And I have a sermon and a PowerPoint for each one of the Beatitudes. And we're not going to do that. We're going to kind of look at them all today. But the Sermon on the Mount, here's that word, ashray. That almost certainly Jesus would have said, ashray are the poor in spirit. We translate it, blessed, oh, the bliss of, how fortunate, lucky. Some versions say, lucky are you when you're poor in spirit. That would not have resonated well with the people in the audience that day. But this word ashray, the first letter on the right, because they go right to left, is Aleph. And its original pictograph was an ox with horns. It was the most powerful of all animals in their society. We used to have this bull named George. And if George wasn't mean, he was gentle, but if he didn't want to do something, you might as well kiss your fence goodbye because he's going to put his head down, he's going to push that fence over and go where George wanted to go. And that's Aleph, that's the power. It's usually prescribed to God, God's power, God's strength, God's ways. Aleph, the next letter is Sheen. It's like, um, it's used in words like Shekinah, Shekinah, Shalom, Shabbat. It's always used for the spirit of God over people. The next letter is Resh. It's a picture of a man standing up. And the next letter is Yod. The tiniest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, its pictogram is a hand. A powerful hand, God's right hand to help. So we have the strength of God, the spirit of God, with an upright man helping those who need help. And in fact, the first two letters, Aleph and Sheen, that's Aish, that's the Hebrew word for fire. So now we have fire on the head of man who's helping those who are down. That's the meaning in the letters of Ashrei. And it's a picture of the kingdom of God coming in some way to help the poor in spirit, to help those who are mourning, to help the gentle. We went to the dump in Mexico, had some peanut butter sandwiches and some bottled water. And when we got there, these people were going through the garbage as people would bring it in, trying to find something aluminum or something they could keep. And one of the little girls found a doll without an arm and she hung on to that like it was her greatest treasure. And we're sitting watching in their dirty hands in this filth. And this mentally ill guy that had the strength to do it was stealing things from everybody that found something. And he went up to this little girl and he took that doll. And she started crying. And I thought, that's about as low as you can get, isn't it? She's already got so low. How is she going to get out of that? And we, we gave them water to wash with, and we gave them food, and they stopped going through the garbage. And we stopped for a minute, and we loved on them, and we loved on the little girl. And finally, we got the doll back from the guy and gave it to the little girl. But we drove away, and they went back to their garbage. In, far too, in, the, in the case of Jesus, the woman that came to him in the temple was Ruach Ani. She was facing death here. Whether she was guilty or not, we don't know, but she was as low as she could get, and their accusers were there, and she had no hope, and Jesus came to her defense and said, basically got down on his knees and rode in the dust, 
and everybody left, and he's still on his knees, and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And when she was ready, he helped her stand up. And then when she was ready, she could walk. That's Hashrei. The story of this little girl in Africa had no hope. Had already been abused at this age. Barely had food. And God led a very wonderful woman to her she was able to adopt her and able to bring her out of this poverty and able to give her hope because right now she had no hope. And that's the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom of God now. That's when you and I, when we're able to walk and stand up, we can get on our knees beside somebody and say, how can we help? How can we encourage you? There is a way out. There is a God. There is a better world. When you're ready, I'll help you stand up. And that's why I like this. Uh, oh, and one more. A few years ago, it just hit me so hard. Uh, this, is, this is a church in Walnut Creek, Connecticut. It's in the town of Shady Hook, where they had that first big school shooting where over 20 kids and teachers were killed by a gunman. And many of them went to this church. And what do you tell the parents that come to your church that just went through this and they lost their child and they lost their grandchild? Everybody in that church knew somebody in that grade school. What's the solution to that? Well, that's in the word ashray. And I like this picture because it shows fire on the head of man helping someone stand up. And fire in the New Testament and Old Testament often reflects the presence of God. On the day of Pentecost, they had fire over their heads. That was the presence of God. Out of the burning bush, there was fire. That meant God was there. When Abraham divided the sacrifice he couldn't walk through because he knew he would break the covenant, but God walked through for him and it was a smoking pot of coals. That night in Jerusalem when Jesus was on trial and Peter sneaks into the courtyard and he stops by a fire of burning coals. That's Luke's way of saying, the gospel's way of saying, God was there. The presence of God was there watching what was going on, watching the abuse of his son. And then finally, at the end, when they went back to fishing, waiting for Jesus to meet him in Galilee, there's someone on the shore who has a fire of burning coals with fish on it. And they recognize him as the Lord. So fire on the, the presence of fire is the presence of God. Fire on the head of man. Oh, and just one more. When Zechariah offered incense onto the burning coals, God appeared to him. But, um, and, and, what, and then they, saw, they looked and saw tongues of fire which separated and came to rest on each one of them in Acts. But there's this totally misunderstood scripture in Romans, and he's quoting Proverbs. He said, if your enemy is hungry... Feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And then it says, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals of fire on his head. I can't tell you how many sermons I've, I've, I've listened to that said, that'll teach him. That'll teach your enemy. And really, if you think about it, what are burning coals? They're the presence of God. And where are they? Over him. And what are you doing? You're ministering to your enemy. And the presence of God will be there and will make a difference. And so I think that's what this picture of Ashray is. It's, 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 um, it's this fire, this presence of God with you when you're helping somebody who thinks they can never get up again. 
whether they have cancer or someone they know has cancer or someone just died or a baby died or it's 1918 and the life expectancy is 36 and you're in the midst of a world war and a pandemic way worse than COVID. Are there answers there? And the answer is yes, the kingdom of heaven is, has been, is now, and is yet to come. I remember getting, uh, being on one particular tour, and I'll kind of close with this and one more thought, in Israel. And as fate would have it, we had a unbelieving Jewish guide named Yoni. And everywhere we went, if it even became slightly spiritual or touching, or you're in the presence of where Jesus was, he would launch into this lecture on pottery. And we'd all go to sleep, and we're slapping the bugs, and we're getting sunburned, and he's telling us about pottery. And I'd finally just had enough, and the Lord impressed on me, and we got off the bus at the top of the hill of the Beatitudes where we were going to walk down to where they think Jesus might have sat. And I knew there was a tree there, and there was a rock there, and the Lord impressed upon me that I had to do some teaching there. And I went to our co-leader, John Delancey, the guy I went to Greece with. And I said, I don't know why, but I feel like I'm supposed to do some teaching here. And he goes, okay. And so he went and told the, the pottery guy that he didn't have to teach about pottery here. <laughs> so in my mind, I picture we're going to walk down, and we'll pick some tares, we'll pick some oats, and we'll pick some mustard. And we'll come down to this one special place where there's one tree and there's this rock sitting there and I'm going to sit on the rock and I'm going to teach this message of Ashray. And so we walk down and we get there and there's a guy and his wife sitting on the rock. His ankles are swollen, he looks sunburned, he's been crying, she's been crying. They look just about the picture of destitution, and I'm thinking, all right, maybe we should go somewhere else. And then the Lord says, well, just ask him. I said, would it bother you if I sat down here and we just did a short little teaching? He says, no, go ahead, go ahead. And for whatever reason, I sat on the ground, and I taught this message of Ashray, and I taught that no matter how bad things are, the kingdom of God is still present, and God himself will come and get on his knees beside you if need be, but he'd rather use the rest of his kingdom, the rest of us, but he'll send somebody, some way, to just be on his knees or just sit on the floor with you, just cry with you, just encourage you, and when you're ready, he'll help you stand up. And when you're ready... You can walk again. And it seems impossible now, but that's what the kingdom of heaven is about. It has been, it is now, and it will be. And I finished the little talk, and I just kind of turned to him, and both of them were crying. And I said, I'm sorry to disturb your, your quiet. We'll move on now. And he goes, no, wait. You need to know that I'm the pastor of Walnut Grove Community Church in Connecticut. And last week, the gunman came into our grade school. It's a, we have a large church. I have 27 pastors under me. And we came to here. We had this trip planned for months. And... I'm sitting here with my wife, Ruth. His name was Clive Calver. Sitting here with my wife, Ruth, and we don't have anything. We have a group of 23 coming tomorrow, and I just don't know what to tell them. I just don't know what to tell them, and now I do. And then he looks up at my friend John Delancey, and he goes, wait a minute. I know you. And John goes, how would you know me? He goes, you're the hiking group. I know all of you. You're the hiking group that's been hiking through Israel. Yeah, but how do you know us? Six weeks ago, even before the shooting, 
One of my associate pastors brought in the tour brochure with your picture on it and laid it on my desk. And it's been sitting there. And every day for six weeks, I looked at your picture. And he said, you might run into these guys in Israel. Wouldn't that be funny? Or strange or odd. And so he's sitting on this rock going, God, I do not know what to tell my people when they come tomorrow. And then God orchestrated us to come and to give this message about Ashrei and the kingdom of God has been, is now, and will be. And it doesn't matter how bad it is, you will be able to get up and you will be able to walk again. And then you can go back and encourage those people who still haven't gotten up. That's the kingdom of God. That's Ashrei. That's the Beatitudes that the, the people in the audience heard that day. And then he went, I was supposed to get this out ahead of time. And just to finish, he says, uh, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, it's not good for anything. Throw it out on the road. And I remember being at the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is 30% salt. And you see salt drying on the rocks. But you're walking on what looks like sand but might be salt. And we had this argument. Is that salt or is that sand? And so I scooped up this bottle full of it. Came home, didn't think anything of it, and I got to reading about poor man's salt. They would take this type of salt that had dirt in it and debris in it, but was mostly salt, and they would put it in a handkerchief. And whenever they needed salt for their food, they would dip it in the water and let the water drip on their food, and it added flavor, and it added electrolytes, and it added life to the food. And Jesus said, you are the salt of this world. Well, I did that, and I kept dripping water out until all the salt was gone. This bottle was full, and now this is what's left. There's no more salt here. This is good for nothing. Throw it out. Looks like salt. Looks like what I dipped up, but it's not salt. Right after the Sermon on the Beatitudes and the Ashray, Jesus said, okay, you are the ones that are going to be salt. You're going to get on your knees. You're going to help each other. You're going to walk together. You're going to stand up. And we are going to get through this because there is a better world coming. And darkness will not overwhelm the light. And we will get through this together. And then he said, you're the light of the world. No one lights a lamp. This is lamp was from the Nazareth village that I've told you about. It's not any brighter than a candle. But I remember being in a, a reconstructed house in the Galilee, and they had a, a place, a lampstand, where they put the lamp. Smoke was up the rock, spilled olive oil was there. But it was dark in that house, and with that lamp, just that much light, at least you could see to get around. And Jesus said, you are the light of this world. No one lights a lamp and then puts a basket over it. No, they don't do that. But they put it on the lampstand and it gives light to all the house. So let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You can't be salt that doesn't have salt. And you can't be light with a basket over it. That's what we're called to do is be light. And I don't know what God's going to open up for you this week. And maybe it's you. Maybe something's going to happen and you're going to be on the ground and you're going to say, I can never go on with life again. I'm thinking suicide. I'm thinking whatever. And maybe someone else in this congregation or in the kingdom of God will come and get down beside you on their knees and talk to you and encourage you and hug you and whisper God's words in your ear and say, when you're ready, I'll help you get up. Light shines in the darkness, and darkness cannot overwhelm it. And it might seem dark today. It might seem really dark. But each one of us 
and all of us are the light of the world. Everyone who is a believer is part of the kingdom of heaven, which has been, is now, and will to be to come. And is that light in darkness that really does illuminate and change the world. So I'm anxious to see how God's going to use you as salt and light this week, or maybe you're going to need others to come around you and help you stand up. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your sermon. Thank you for your compassion and love. Thank you for the kingdom that is here now and the king we have. Father, I pray in this time of anxiety and darkness with the fires, with people dying, with things going on in the world, that you will, you will help us to be salt. You will help us to be light. You'll show us who we need to get down on our knees beside. And if we don't do it, Lord, you will. You're faithful. And we just want to join you in this kingdom. I just pray, Lord, that this will be an amazing week that as disciples we will get to be on this journey with you and you'll show us people who need salt, show us people who need light. I just praise you. Thank you for supernaturally meeting us today, putting this message together, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And this is a picture of Clive Calver and his wife sitting on that rock in the Galilee when God met them there, showed him the flyer for six weeks ahead of time. And so what do we take home? We become the kingdom of heaven as now. We hear and obey. We are the Ashrei to the Ruach Ani. We need to understand the heart of God in joining him in the kingdom of heaven now and to be salt and light in the kingdom. We're at this, I'll close with this, we're at the month of Elul, which is the month that the lion constellation is in the sky. That's when the temple burned the first time. That's when the temple burned the second time. That's when judgment comes. Is this going to be the end of the world? Is this the end of the cycle when Messiah is going to return and there will be judgment? If not, he's standing next to the virgin, which will be the next constellation, and we're going to start another year. And it might be our last year. Can we go through this year together and can we start looking for the return of the king and start encouraging people? Because the sun rose in the womb of the virgin when, he, when Jesus was born in this next coming month. And that's the cycle we'll start over again with new life and new chances and new direction. But I don't want to miss anticipating his return when the trumpets all start blowing in two weeks. So let's start looking for that too. So, amen.